All right, I want to take, um, have us take some notes on confidence interval. So in order to do that, so first I just want to quickly review the three types of normal curves to make sure we know what we're working with. They all look the same. We've got standard normal, normal, and sampling distribution. Um, so how to describe each one. You've got your normal curve, right, which is just, it can look a little bit different depending on that standard deviation. Um, it can be wide if it's big, if the standard deviation is big, if it's small, it's going to be narrow, but it's all going to always have the same area underneath of 1 or 100%. And we used to describe individuals. So I was just looking at like my test score and my percentage, uh, my percentile in a class. We also have our standard normal. This is when we want to compare things and we're talking about z-score. So anytime I'm talking about a z-score, I'm on a standard normal curve. You can see the z-scores right down here and it always has this distribution. Okay, so it's great for comparing data. But the new one that I'm looking at that I'm really interested in is sample distribution curve. Um, and that's what I'm looking at a group. So instead of looking at my score, I might compare my class of 25 and its average score across all classes and see our percentile as a class. The distribution looks a little bit different. Actually has a smaller standard deviation because when you take an average of a lot of people, we kind of um, wash out those extremes. So the standard deviation shrinks with a mean. If you're looking at means by square root of n, if it's kind of a yes, no questions, and we're just looking at a percent, it's going to um, be this will be your standard deviation. But again, that curve, even though it's a group, it's still going to look the same. So when we describe them, I keep saying over and over, describe the distribution. What I mean by the distribution, I just mean tell me the center, which is your mean, and tell me that standard deviation. And that kind of gives me a description of what um, my normal curve is. All right, so now let's look at what we've been talking about recently, is finding values on a sample distribution curve, which can feel confusing at first. I want to say again, it's just like dealing with any normal curve. Okay, the one thing that's a little confusing, as I first have to decide, is it about a mean or proportion? Or when I think of proportion, I actually say it should probably say percent. Um, once I've decided that, I'm going to check my conditions. If it's mean, it's about a measurement. Um, my um, sample size just has to be greater than 30. And if it's a percent or proportion, excuse that typo there, um, I just need to know that n sample size times that percent is greater than 10, or n times 1 minus p is greater than 10. That's 10 successes, 10 failures. Once I have done this, I'm like, OK, I've checked my conditions. I can use a normal curve, which is awesome, because with groups, I don't have to worry about that idea of symmetric or unimodal. It's always going to work with groups, OK? I just need to check the sample size. I'm going to find the distribution, which always, again, means find that center, find Find the standard deviation. If the distribution is going to be different whether it's a, per a percent or whether it's a mean. And once I do that, I draw my curve. So the problem now, I'm dealing with just like any old normal problem. I want to know what's the chance of a class of 25 um, getting 80% or I guess in this case, less than that. So I'm going to find that area here. So I just go ahead. I mark where my 80% is or where that number is, shade to the left. And then I just use my normal CDF or inverse norm to figure out that value. All right. So just one thing else to say about this that's kind of interesting is how that normal curve changes a little bit when your sample size changes. So I told you that the standard deviation shrinks a little bit with sample size. Okay, it shrinks by the square root of n. So um, when sample size increases, something interesting happens. If my normal curve looks like this, say I have a super small uh, sample size, what's going to happen to this normal curve when the sample size grows? Well, if you think about it, shrinking, it's going to get even narrower. So now it's got an n of 5, and that normal curve is going to get even narrower. If it gets even bigger, so as that sample size increases, this gets even smaller. So my standard deviation gets smaller and smaller, and I get a much, much tighter idea of what's going on. So just to kind of keep that in mind. Now, we talked about Akumal today, um, which is where there's a big study going on on CFANS and diseases there. And we want to use this idea of uh, sample distribution. And what we're sampling is groups of CFANS and seeing if they're getting this disease or not, right? So we know that the coral reefs used to be pretty nice and full, but we've seen this huge deterioration um, in coral reefs over time. So we wanted to look at 
the diseased coral reefs and to figure out exactly what percent of sea fans are becoming diseased. Okay, well, the problem is this is a hard study to do. It's super extensive, so we can't go out and tr check out every single reef all over the world and every single sea fan. So we're not going to know what we call our true P, the true percent, but we can take a sample. All right, and when we take a sample, we no longer can use just P. P implies this is the real proportion of diseased um, of diseased sea fans. P hat is really exactly the same in the way we're using it mathematically. The only difference now is that I'm letting you know that this is just from a sample. It's not the true overall thing. So that little hat is just letting the world know that this is just a sample. It's not everything. So because of that, I can't use the true standard deviation, but I use what looks exactly the same. Again, the math is not changing at all. I'm just using my little P hat and I'm calling it standard error. Okay, um, so let's look at the steps for finding confidence interval with this p hat since we know we're only looking at one thing. So the first thing you do is you just need to find your p hat. To find it, you simply do the number of yeses, that would be the number of C fans that are diseased over n, n being um, the total number I look at. The next thing you do is you find the standard deviation, or in this case, the standard error, since again, we're only taking one sample, we're not looking at everything in the world, and state the distribution. All right, so we know that that is our standard error. Then we find the margin of error. Margin of error is Z times the standard error. Now, what Z is here? Z is one of these three numbers, depending on how big I want my confidence interval to be. All right, so if I ask for a 95% confidence interval, I'm going to plug in 1.96. So I just always need to keep that in my notes so I can reference what number of Z am I going to be using um, to find my margin of error. The next thing I'm going to do is find the upper and lower confidence intervals. I do that by simply adding P hat minus um, the margin of error and P hat plus the margin of error. So these are just pretty uh, skeleton notes. I know they might not make a lot of sense. I'm going to show them in an example in a second, but I just want you to have the skeleton notes of the steps for finding your confidence interval. Okay. The very last step, of course, is stating your findings with the sentence, we are 95% confident that between blank and blank are, and I would say, diseased or whatever the situation is that I'm looking at. Okay, so let's look at a quick example um, for finding the confidence interval. All right, so going back to C fans, we know we did one sample, so we're dealing with P hat. We haven't checked everything out, but we did find that 54 out of 104 are infected. What is the 95% confidence interval? So I find my P, I do my yes infected over my total N number that I studied right here and right here. I get 51.9. I find the standard error and state the distribution. All right, so my standard error, I plug all the numbers in for that. I get 4.9. So the distribution is, again, my P hat, and then my standard error. Okay. Then I find the margin of error, which is Z times the standard error. So my Z here, ooh, I have a Z typo, it should be 9.6 times 0.049. So um, this should be, sorry, 1.96 from Z, and the 0.049 comes from here. And then I'm going to find the upper and lower confidence interval by plugging in these numbers. All right. So my P hat, way up here. Okay, so I've got my P hat and the margin of error that I just found there. I'm going to subtract it and I'm going to add it from P hat. And that's going to give my lower and my upper confidence interval. So with that, I can now make a sentence. Now the difference is P hat is just a point. And I don't know the chance of this happening. I could say, yeah, one study I got 51.9. But now with a confidence interval, I can really let you know um, this is how sure I am. No idea how likely I'm correct. I doubt do know. I have some sense. I'm 95 correct that the true number of infected C fans is between this and this. So I have a much more information. 